Now, one of the more interesting things we can do with categorical data, one category is very interesting, but what if we can compare two categorical variables? So now we're going to look at some of the ways to do that. And one of the ways we start with is called a two-way table. So I showed you the data from my first period, which was a rather small class. And I went ahead and completed the table to show my third and my sixth period classes. So um, what are the two categorical variables in here? It's lunch type. Don't say burgers and tacos. Those are the categories for this categorical variable. And class period. And the categories for that are, will be first, second, uh, first, third, and sixth. All right. So what percent of students prefer uh, burgers for lunch? I'm going to go ahead and fill in these margins. Hint, that's part of one of the things we need to learn. And I'm going to create a distribution here. This is actually considered a distribution for first period. This is a distribution for third. This is a distribution for six. All right. So I just add up across to figure out the total number of kids who like burgers and tacos, etc. And I find there are a total of 61 kids. Now, if I go by class, I get slightly different numbers because here I'm just comparing everybody in the class. So in first period, I had a very small class. Uh, third was 24 and six was 24, which is still moderately sized. And if you add those up, that also adds up to 61. So this is what I like to call the total total because it's the total both this way, uh, vertically and horizontally. So percent of burgers in my, uh, what percent of students prefer burgers for lunch? Well, I'm not just going to count my fourth, my four kids in first. I'm going to count all of these kids. And I didn't specify a class period, so I'm just going to use 61. Okay. So I have percent burgers is 22 over 61.36, or roughly 36%. What percent of students are in my first period? Well, that would be all of these students out of all of those. And that is 0 0.2131, or roughly 21.3%. Okay. Usually when you're doing percentages, um, going to the tenths of a percent is usually good. All right. Okay. So now we remember how I was talking about these margins here. Marginal distributions are the relative frequencies for just one categorical variable. Um, now, remember, what are my categorical variables? They're not burgers or first. It's lunch type or class period. These are my totals for lunch type. These are my totals for cat, uh, class period. Now, we like to do relative frequencies because that's much more useful to us. I mean, you could do absolute, but relative is better. So we use a row in the column totals. So these are the row totals here, and these are the column totals there. I know it feels weird, counterintuitive, but that's the total for that column. You see that? To calculate, what you're going to do is divide whichever row or column total you're working on by the total uh, for the entire table, what I like to call the total total. All right, so for lunch type, if I'm doing the marginal distribution, I don't really care about first, third, or six. I'm only using the red numbers here. And I'm going to be dividing by the purple number. And I'm going to have to do it for all five types. Burger, 22 over 61, 36.1. Tacos, and I, MD I just put for marginal distribution. Uh, 12 over 61 is 19.7%. And 7 over 61 you can see there's a 7 over 61. It's 11.5%. Then I'll do 1 over 61 and 19 over 61. So there's my marginal distribution for lunch type. I could omit this little fractional part, but it's very helpful to see it to know where the percents come from. All right, so I could actually write 36.1%, 19.7%. 11.5%, 1.6%, and 31.1% in this margin. Okay, how about class period? Works the same way, except now instead of the red numbers, I'm going to use the blue numbers because 13 is for first period. And I get 21.3. And my other two are identical, making them pretty easy. 
All right. Notice that the percent for each of my marginal distributions, if I had put 21.3 here, 39.3, 39.3, they would add up to 100%. Now you might be a teensy bit off due to rounding error, but if you're off by more than say 0.3%, you probably have a mathematical error going on. So um, these, so you can see this actually adds up to 99.9%. This one I'm pretty sure adds up very close to 100%. So um, what percent of students in Mrs. Overman's survey are in third period and prefer burgers? So when this, we have to meet both of these requirements. So third period in burgers is seven students. And they said what percent of students? So that means all students. So seven over 61 is 11.5%. Now, when you specify two categorical variables like that we did, we said third period and preferred burgers, it's called a joint relative frequency. To calculate it, you divide the counts that fall into the one cell. See how that yellow cell right there for both categories. So it has to meet both of them and then divide by the total, what I like to call the total total for the entire table. All right. What is the joint relative frequency for six period in tacos? So I'll go, oh, that's the number divided by 61. So six period and tacos is four over 61, 6.6%. All right. So notice how these are saying the word and. That's probably something you want to make a note of because that's how you can tell. We're going to deal with something called conditional and given, and that's different. All right. What percent of six period students prefer tacos? Well, six period students that prefer tacos, there are four. Now, am I going to divide that by 61? Well, we kind of specify that only six period students. So I don't have 61 students in six period. How many students do I have? 24. So um, the, the conditional relative frequency, which I'm going to give you the term ta for tacos, in six period is four out of 24, 16.7%. And as I just gave away, that's called a conditional relative frequency. So it gives a percent of individuals that fall into a specific category for one variable among everyone who falls to, into a specific category for another variable. All right. And so the specific category was tacos among six. So six is our total. To calculate it, to divide the counts that are in both categories by the total for the given category. And that's a, you're going to see given a lot. So let me explain what was given. What was given? Oh, we know uh, it's given to us that we're only looking at six period students. All right. I know you might say, but we're only looking at tacos. Yeah, but we're not looking at everybody who likes tacos. We're just looking at people who like tacos who are in six period. So if I say, now let's flip the tables and say, I'm going to tell you for sure we're only looking at people who like tacos. So given a student prefers tacos, what percent of them are in six period? So basically I'm going to do six period uh, that like tacos. So the number for both of them, still that four. And now instead of using six period on the denominator, I'm going to use the number of taco kids in the denominator. So it's 12 or 33.3%. I will admit this thing with the given and the conditional relative frequency tends to be the most confusing um, to my students. So if it says given again, another thing I might recommend is so we have given they like tacos. Let me go ahead and do this really quickly. That means that this is your world. That's all you care about. You know the kid likes tacos and that's it. For the other problem here, I'll do uh, change it to blue, a nice light blue. For the first example here, we knew the student was in six periods. So this is my world and my number should only come out of that column. So for the first example, the blue column here is to find uh, the percent of six period students who prefer tacos because we know we're only talking about six. The yellow row here is the um, 
we know the student likes tacos and what percent of them are in sixth period. Hopefully, again, work with it. We'll get some practice. This tends to be one of the trickiest types of uh, questions we do. All right, now graphing two-way tables is way easier, actually. It's not so bad. So it's like doing a side-by-side -side bar graph. So it's like, um, so that's one of the most common methods. And it's really easy. You saw how we did bar graphs, right? So if we had food preferences for my first period, which I already did, to do a side-by-side -side bar graph, and then I just do first period and then third period and then sixth period. So it's like I have three little bar graphs together. So it is like making separate bar graphs for each category. First, you will need to convert to relative frequencies so um, that the uh, total in each category adds up to 100%. Technically, you could do it with absolute, but it'll be misleading and it's much harder to compare. We normally like to know percentages. So I'm going to go ahead and I want to make a side-by-side -side bar graph, but I'm going to convert my table. So I'm going to go ahead and do some math. Um, so the percent who prefer burgers in first period is, and please refer to your table for this. So we know that this, they're in first period and that's given. So I'm dealing with the column of uh, first period. How many of those people like burgers is four. Percent who prefer tacos in first period is four out of 13. Percent who prefer burgers in sixth period is 11 out of 24 or 45.8%. The percent who prefer burgers in third period is 7 out of 24, and tacos in third is 4 out of 24. And I already did tacos in six. So now I'm going to show you the completed table, putting in those numbers right there. And um, so these numbers, when you add them all up, so this is the table. I basically already went ahead and did it for the other. So I said, 2 divided by uh, 13, 1 divided by 13, 2 divided by 13 to get these numbers over here. It's just easier to make a completely separate table. All right, so now that we have our beautiful table, we're going to make a side-by-side -side bar graph. And again, please refer to that table you just filled out. And the one thing you want to do is set up your scale. Now, the highest percentage in my graph was 46%. So if I go to 50%, that's fine. I like to use nice round numbers, multiples of 5 and 10. And then, so I'm going to go 10, 20, 30, 40. The reason is I have 10 uh, units up, so that rounds out nicely. And then I'll go ahead and do first period, and believe it or not, there's your distribution, which looks a lot like what we just did, right? That's the relative frequency we looked at earlier. And then I'm going to add in third period and sixth period. And it's always good to add a legend. So there's my legend right there. And I tried to do these so that if you are doing pencil notes, you can kind of use my patterns. So they're all the same color. Don't forget your title, which is preferred lunch. Okay. So this is a side by side bar graph. So you've got a bar graph here and a bar graph there and a bar graph there side by side. Now a segmented bar graph is just like a side by side bar graph, except let me go back. I'm going to take these little pieces and stack them up. And so they should add up to what? 100%. So they're stacked up by adding up to 100%, which means that my scale is 100%. I know this is 10 units, so I'll, I'm just going to do every other to make it clean. And I'm going to do a segment and bar graph for each lunch. Now, I, now I only need three stacked graphs. So one for first, one for third, and there's first period and third period and sixth period. So it's on segmented graphs, you can see they're always going to be the same height. And it's really great when you're trying to compare classes and look at different variables. I know some people like side by side. I personally prefer the stack bar graph, especially if you're looking like, I want to know what this total is. You can combine um, if they're in the right order. Don't forget your legend and your title. All right. A mosaic plot is like a segmented bar graph. So I, what I did is I took this, don't draw this part right now. I took the segmented bar graph and I'm going to show you how it changes for a mosaic. The difference is instead of having uniform bar widths, they're now proportional. So I'm going to have to do first period. So it's roughly the size 
uh, represents the proportion of first period. So the way I made my life easier is this is 10 units wide. So each unit is 10% here. Well, first period, I think, was like 21%. So I need to stretch this out. All right, so there it is, roughly 21%. And both of these, I think, were 39%. So I'm going to stretch out third period so that when I add them, it's right about there. And this will leave 39% for six. And you can see, voila, that is a mosaic plot. So it's kind of cool because you can say, okay, this is a distribution for first, but if I look at, I can look at kind of like totals over the entire population to compare, and uh, it's just kind of cool. Uh, now, has this been on the AP test yet? No, we have not seen it on the AP test. It is in our binder that um, gives us information on the class. So it is fair game for the AP test. And there are some teachers like, oh, won't be on the AP test. And some teachers, oh, maybe. So anyways, it's really not a hard graph to make. It's just a segmented bar graph that's been stretched out a, a proportionally in the horizontal dimension to represent how big each of the other categories are. In this case, this categorical variable. All right, last but not least, association. You are expected to determine if there's an association between two categorical variables. If they're independent, no association, then we expect the frequencies. Um, we do not expect the frequencies to be that different. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, the amount of girls in my first period and my uh, second period should be about the same, okay? Or the amount of people who love burgers in my first period and my third period should be about the same. Now, if there is an association, then knowing which period I'm talking about or knowing what percent like burgers, you can say, oh, you're probably talking about that class, all right? So are the food types, do they seem to be independent of class period, uh, if any of them? What food types seem to be independent and why? I thought nachos, the height of that bar, was kind of the same. I mean, it was a little different, so it wasn't exactly the same. But compared to everybody else, that one was the most steady one. So that seemed to be kind of independent um, among class periods. But every other food type definitely changed with class periods. So I couldn't use first period to predict food preferences for third period. I could have used the nacho preference to roughly predict. And remember, in statistics, we're not exact. It's a beautiful thing.